This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Welcome to StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or a review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, I'm incredibly excited to have as my guest today one of the most versatile performers ever to work on Broadway and beyond, one of Pittsburgh's greatest talents, the incomparable Lenora Nemitz. Lenora is one of a rare breed of musical theater performers. She's acted, sung, and danced her way across the U.S. for more than four decades. Lenora first appeared on Broadway in the original Hal Prince production of Cabaret with Lotta Lenya. A protege of the legendary Bob Fosse, Lenora was simultaneously the standby for both Gwen Verdon and Cheetah Rivera, who were her idols and mentors, as well as for Liza Minnelli in the original Broadway production of Chicago. She ultimately went on to replace Cheetah Rivera as Velma Kelly, garnering rave reviews. For her performance as Dolores Dante in Stephen Schwartz's Broadway production of Studs Terkel's Working, Lenora received a Drama Desk nomination. At Broadway's Biltmore Theater, she starred opposite the original Boy from Oz, Peter Allen, in Up in One. Lenora was again reunited with Cheetah Rivera and Liza Minnelli while standing by for Liza in Candor and Ebb's The Rink. She appeared at the New York City Opera as Gladys in the revival of Pajama Game and as Miss Cratchit and Miss Mazeppa, the trumpet-playing stripper in the acclaimed Tony Award-winning revival of Gypsy, directed by another Broadway legend, Arthur Lawrence. As standby for Patti LuPone, Lenora wowed audiences when she took the stage as Mama Rose. Her Broadway national tours include Bob Fosse's Sweet Charity, Bye Bye Birdie opposite Tommy Toon, another mentor of hers, the Sam Mendes Rob Marshall revival of Cabaret, and Some Like It Hot with Tony Curtis. TV appearances include Flora in Flora the Red Menace and Ellie Mae Chipley in Showboat. Lenora has entertained her hometown Pittsburgh audiences from every theatrical corner of the city. She's worked at the Pittsburgh Playhouse, the Pittsburgh CLO, as both an assistant choreographer and performer since the 1970s. She was so inspired by teaching and guiding young talents and future Broadway stars from right here in the Steel City that she started the musical theater department at Kappa, Pittsburgh's creative and performing arts school. Lenora is currently at work on a new show called Halftime, being helmed by the much-in-demand director and choreographer Jerry Mitchell. For all of those reasons and many more, I am truly delighted to have as my guest in the studio today on StoryBeat, the awesome force of nature better known as Lenora Nemitz. Lenora, welcome. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Oh, well, thank you for <laughs> stopping by. You have no idea what a thrill it is for me. So let's, let's get into your history just a little bit. What was your very first creative love? How did you get into this business of show? Oh, well, I don't remember walking and talking. I remember singing and dancing. And, uh, from what age? Mm, I don't know, from the age of two, I two. guess. When you, Yeah, and my grandmother... Uh, we lived in my grandmother's house on the north side, 844 Reedsdale Street, where the casino is now. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, she, she had a, a, an attic. The attic was, was her bedroom and her place. It was, it was pretty big. And, and it was like a fantasy world to me. Uh, you used and she, encour- she encouraged me to sing and dance because she saw that I had a gift. Thank God, you know. Um, and uh, did you get lessons as a little girl? Well, I started dancing. Yeah, I, I studied at a dance studio in the neighborhood, uh, Marie and Andrea's dance studio, <laughs> on Ridge Avenue. It was in one of those um, mansions that are now uh, 
the uh, the the college. What is the college over there? It's over uh, on the north side. Yeah, it's um, community college. Okay. Oh, it, sure. Yeah, they've taken those those big buildings. You know, well, this was a mansion. It was a, amazing, and the the staircase that you would walk up to go to the from the grand ballroom to go to the dance studio was uh, it was majestic. It was and it was like you know up the steep and very narrow staircase to the voice of a net metronome, like a chorus line, sure. you know, a lyric from a chorus line. Sure. Um, you know, it was great. And so you, you actually, from that age on, knew this is what you wanted to do. I always knew what I wanted to do. I had my own nightclub act when I was 15. Really? Yes, I did. Here in Pittsburgh? Yes, I did. Where did you perform here? I Pittsburgh? performed it. All of the moose and the elks and the eagles <laughs> in Pittsburgh, the, Pennsylvania. In, there wasn't uh, a single animal that didn't have you in their studio. That's their place. right. That's right. And, <laughs> and West Virginia and uh, Ohio. And there were a couple of clubs, too, that were uh, there was Pat McBride's, the Holiday House, Riviera, um, uh, the Bloomfeld Moose that had a. The Bloomfeld Moose. Oh, it was great. The stage was fabulous. It was circular and it was lifted. So you would come up. It was like uh, Velma Kelly's entrance in, the, uh, in, in, Chicago, in Chicago in the original. Sure. Because you'd come up on an elevator, you know. And, and what kind of an act was it? Just singing and dancing? Well, or? I'd sing and dance. I'd do all my favorite Broadway show tunes. Uh, and uh, I'd do most of my own choreography. Um, and there would always be a headliner, and I would be the opening act. And the closing act. So I would do uh, like a song and tap dance for the first first 15 minutes. And then at the end, I would do all of my Broadway stuff. Did you, you act know? like the MC? No. Mm. I, they had an MC. There was an MC. Yeah, he'd say, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bloomfeld Moose. You know, <laughs> oh, my God, we are happy to have. Oh, oh, oh my God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sherry Lane. <laughs> Sherry Lane, she was the uh, Judy Garland of Pittsburgh. Oh, she was so good. She was so good. I remember working with her and Jeannie Baxter. And then there were some headliners who came from out of town. Sammy Davis Jr. was mm. at the Riviera, and I did that with him. Wow. Um, I was 16. Yeah. The Sammy Davis yeah, Jr. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, I, I, I bet it was. <laughs> and I did it on Saturday nights because I was still in high school, and my mother used to come with me, and uh, sometimes a friend of mine from high school would drive us, or my cousin my cousin and her boyfriend. Did would you, drive us. when you work with someone like a Sammy Davis Jr. at that age, was he thoughtful to you? Was oh, he yeah. helpful? What What did you learn from him? What did he? Well, he was just. Uh huh. Uh, we didn't talk that much. I I actually got to work with him more when I worked with Bob. Bob Fosse. Bob Fosse. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So so all right. So um, uh, who at that age or at that stage were your heroes? Who did you want to be? I wanted to be. Gwen Verdon, Sheeta mm. Rivera, Shirley MacLaine, uh, Doris Day. I wanted to be like Bob Fosse, choreograph. I wanted to be like Ronald Field. Uh, yeah, those people. And you eventually got to work with many, if not most, of those people. I did. I got to work with all of my idols. All of I, your idols. Uh, never Shirley MacLaine but, uh, or Doris Day. You, but You know very few people actually have that happen for them. You're aware of that. Very few people ever actually get to work with their idols. I wasn't aware of that until I got older. <laughs> At the time, I thought this was normal. It's normal, yeah. sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think it's it's miraculous that you got to do that. I was. I'm so grateful that I, I that to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there are no coincidences in this world. The no. way things happen, God just put me in the right place at the right time, and I'm so grateful for that. And gave you the right talent. Well, yeah. A, a, a gift should not be abused, and, and I, I learned the hard way. And clearly your talent has uh, been in good standing for you for a really long time. And I don't mean to, I'm not even trying to put an age on you at all, but the fact is you've been at it for a while. I have. And and most people who sing and dance, there's usually some kind of a, a sell-by date where it's, you know, you're not going to be, keep you're not going to do it forever. And most people um, in their 30s are already starting to fade. And so it's amazing that you've been able to just keep at it. Oh, I thank God every morning that I can walk, you know, that I'm alive. I do. And, you know, I'm going to be 68 in November. Well, aren't you brave to even say that? Well, yeah, but, you know, it's fun to be, it's fun to be older. And, and to be, it, it's I, I want to inspire people, you know. 
Uh, that's my... How is it you want to inspire people? What do you want to do? Just just by doing it? Well, I like uh, to inspire uh, seniors by, you know, not stopping. Once they say to you, you you know, you can't work here any longer. And that's what's that's part of halftime, isn't it? Yes. The show that you've been working on with Jerry Mitchell. Yeah, we don't stop. You don't it's stop. Got, it used to be called Gotta Dance, you know. It was a documentary. Why change it to halftime? I don't know. I liked the other title. Myself. I think Gotta Dance is a better title, although people might think that it's a Gene Kelly retrospective. They thought that it was a song, and it was never a song. It was just a lyric in a song. That's right. You know, Gotta Dance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why I think maybe, the, if I had to guess, there might have been a change to that because people thought there'd be a misperception as to what the show is. Halftime now makes me think it's a football show. Yeah. It has. It's a. It's about people performing at halftime, correct? Correct. We're a, a, a dance troupe at the halftime of a of basketball games. Of a basketball game. Yes. At, at all over the country or in one place? Just in New Jersey. In New Jersey. Yeah, it's a true story. Who, who wrote it? Uh, well, it's who started to write it was uh, Marvin Hamlish. Oh, really? Yes. He first started. I got, I got the, you know, I didn't know him, but I got to meet him here in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago, just before he passed away. What a great! So energy. that was that was like amazing to me to get to meet him because he's he was one of the true greats. He was. I mean, just a chorus line alone, but there's a thousand other things he did that were truly amazing. I know he was amazing. I met I, when I worked with Peter Allen, mm -hmm. and when we did Up in One, we went to Marvin's uh, apartment. When he, and he was, I think Carol was, Carol Bayer Seger. Yes, she was. She was still his, uh, his, girl, his, 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 his partner. Bow, sure. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Peter had written a song for me called I'd Never Thought I'd Break. And we, we went to Marvin's, uh, apartment and, uh, Peter was like, oh, Angel, Marvin's going to listen to the song, you know. So Peter got on the piano and played it, and I stood there and sang it, you know, sang my torch song. And after we finished, Marvin said, well, that was terrible. I don't think you should do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, oh, you should have seen The two of us were like, oh, my, what are we going to do? Well, anyway, he said, I'll show him. <laughs> and uh, what happened was Marvin apologized after opening night. And his mother was with him. And I got to meet his mother as well. But what a great energy he had. Marvin. Marvin. He was amazing. And I assume that you yeah. could say the same for Peter Allen. Well, Pete. Well, he was great. Yeah, and he was, he was a tall drink of water and very talented. What a, a generous person he was to me, you know. In what way? How was he generous to you? Oh, uh, well, he, well, you know, he was doing a show f for himself and, and, um, uh, Craig Zaden and uh, Neil Marin. Neil Marin, sure. They they said we got a girl that you should look at to uh, perform with, and uh, you know he didn't know me from from Eve, and so he 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 saw a video of me singing "I Can Cook Too," uh, that I did uh, at the Lenny Bernstein birthday. Really? Uh, yeah, it was star studded. There were so many people there. I we bet. Were like we were all. You know, just gaga. Um, anyway, he hired me to play in his one-man show for Broadway, and we were at the Biltmore. Was uh, it you and him and no one else? Just him and me. That's awesome. I know. And, and it, he just took me under his wing and was kind and generous, and, and he uh, opened doors for me, you know. He was great. Well, I'm sure he opened doors for you and others, but the fact that you were, it's just, just you and him on stage, that's amazing. What were, was it, were there, how did that, I didn't know that. I don't know Up and One. So how did that show work? What was it about? It was silly. We used to think it was silly because he would come out and, and, and uh, it was about him and it was mostly his songs. And then I would just appear out of nowhere and say, <laughs> I heard you have a show going on and we're, you were auditioning. <laughs> oh, you were auditioning. You were auditioning people, and so here I am, you know. And that's how it would start. And then we'd start talking, and then I would sing for him and dance for him. And then we'd do uh, uh, the song, uh, Everything Old is New Again, you know. And sure. then I'd come back in the second act, and and I would tell him that my boyfriend broke up with me. And, uh, and my boyfriend at the time was Marvin Hamlish's voice. <laughs> That's how Marvin <laughs> Marvin had a part in this too. I forgot. Even though he hated that song. Even though, he, but he loved it after we after he saw it on stage. <laughs> he took it back. Did that song wind up in Up and One? 
Yeah. Was, that was your song. Yeah. So you didn't take it out because he oh, said no, it was we too sh- heavy. We said, we're going to show him. We'll show him. Got it. Got yeah. it. Well, that's... <laughs> is, there, is there ever a better way to do that than to do what you did? Isn't that funny? When people say to you, you can't do that, or if you're in show business and someone says to you, you can't do that, oh, you'll never be on Broadway. Oh, you won't. Isn't that funny how... It, it it does happen. You don't know? don't challenge a person who's not easily challenged. You know, challenge them the hardest way you can. Or I should say it the other way. Don't challenge a person who isn't. Uh, it doesn't have a problem with challenge. Then they're going to come down your throat every single time. It was funny. That is funny. Yeah. So all right. So um, you've been in a obviously a wide number of shows over a long period of time. I'm going to ask you a hard question, and that is this. You have these amazing gifts. You're an actor. You're a singer. You're a dancer. If somebody said to you, I could, you get the choice. You only get to choose one of those talents for the rest of your career. Would it be, would there be one? Oh, I don't know. I ask, I ask this question of other people, too. And the reason why I ask the question is, um, it's interesting to me that when you're practicing whatever your craft is, because whatever your gifts are, I assume that you've worked at them your whole life. They, you haven't just gotten up every morning and just gone on stage and performed. You had to work at it. So which of those is the most compelling for you, if you had to choose? Well, you know, I started as a dancer, but I always sang anyway, even if people didn't want to hear me. And I was always acting because I, I was... I've heard you sing, and they want to hear you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and, I, and, and I've always been an actress because that's how we approach dance and, and song. Sure. You know, so it's hard to do that. But I would say, you know, Gwen always said, a dancer dies twice in their life. First, when they stop dancing, uh, when they can't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And... And second, when you know we make our transition, um, I I guess since I'm gonna not be able to dance uh, at a certain point, I don't know. That's so hard. I love music so much. Well, you'll still be having the music. You just won't be singing it if you're gonna be a dancer for the rest of your career. It's a ridiculous question, I know, but but I think it's interesting the way people answer it and what they they know they think of as their. The, their base, and I think probably dance is yours. I think that's pretty obvious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of obvious. So, all right, let's talk about some of these amazing people and what you've learned from them, because this show is about how we do what we do. So I'm interested in these unbelievable humans who you've had the great privilege of working with, like Bob Fosse, like Gwen Verdon. What did, let's take them sort of one at a time. What did Bob Fosse do that is different from pretty much everybody else you've worked with that was uniquely him that you could pass along to people who are trying to figure out how to make their lives go as someone in the business? Mm, That's, he was, uh, so he he was really, so everybody I worked with was so creatively a genius, you know, they, uh, Bob, the thing, I can't say just one thing. It could be more than one. Yeah. I was lucky to, to be. Uh, oh man. How did, I, how did he how did he approach rehearsal? Well, when we rehearsed, I, I rehearsed with Bob alone, most of the time. Is that right? Yeah, because I was chosen to stand by for Gwen, in Chicago, the original Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had just had open heart surgery, mm-hmm. and he was looking for a replacement for Gwen. So my friend, Norman Roth, sent my picture and resume in without my knowing it to Michael Shirtliff. Wow. And, uh, and they called back and said, yeah, we'd like to see her. So we went to the audition, and uh, I auditioned for Bob. First I auditioned for Michael, then I auditioned for Bob. And the, the audition was at the Imperial Theater, and that's where Pippin was. Uh, and this was 1975. Mm. And that's when you auditioned in the theater, you know, instead of now you audition in rehearsal rooms. Sure. But then you, if you had the, you know, that aesthetic distance and it was more theatrical. Just the way they show it in a chorus line. Yeah. In, yeah. in the theater. Yeah. And uh, I auditioned first in the, the first time and then I auditioned for him. Um, when he, uh, and he called me back. He called me back. And... 
I got a call back and I went. And I didn't take anything because the stage manager said, don't take anything. I, I, I went to the audition and he was there and Kathy Doby and it was in his studio at Broadway Arts uh, refor- uh, re- rehearsal studios. Mm-hmm. He had his own room. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, what are you going to sing for me? And I said, well, I don't, I, 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 Mr. Friedman told me I wasn't supposed to bring anything to sing. <laughs> and he said, Phil, did you do that? And Phil said, oh, Bobby, I, you know, I, 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 he said, well, what can you sing? And I said, well, you know, I could sing. And I said, Broadway, uh, what's that song? Uh, broad, come on along and listen Broadway to melody. the lullaby of Broadway. Right, well, sure. Yeah. And I, I said to him, uh, he said, okay. And it, Peter Howard, who was playing the piano at the time, he said, uh, what key does she sing in it? And he said, oh, she sings it in Gwen's key. Because I had worked with Peter, uh, Peter Howard in Cabaret. It's all connected, of all those energies, is. you know. Uh, this is kind of, I guess it's going to be a longer story than I thought. Go for it. Um, so I, I said to Bob, imagine me on a staircase. That's a set of, of uh, Manhattan and uh, Broadway. And uh, I'm at the top of the staircase, and I'm, uh, you know, Take it from there. So I just started to improvise, and Peter played, and I did the number. And he was very happy about that. Um, and uh, You're talking about Bob, not yeah, Peter. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, yeah. He liked it. And uh, and so I was spontaneous, you know. I, I imagine that there are many dancers who would give their eye teeth to have Bob Fosse like an audition. Well, then then he asked me, what else do you know? And I didn't know that the show Chicago was going to have Mr. Cellophane in it. I didn't know anything about that show because it hadn't been, you know, rehearsed yet. No sure. one knew. Right. Uh, I said, I know me and my shadow. And he said, oh, I like that song. I said, okay. I said, are you using that top hat? He had a top hat and cane. He said, no. I said, can I use that? I said, can I use your cane? He said, yeah. So then I did, in, you know, an improvisation of, of uh, me and my shadow for him and did my cane tricks and my hat tricks and uh and uh, he really loved that too and then he gave me the song funny honey to sing and i i got on the piano and sang that and sat on the piano and did you know it before you sang no it? no i didn't but my brain was good then i was 25 so <laughs> <laughs> it was easy to you know look at something and learn it for 10 minutes and then kind of remember it and I I used to be able to look at lines and same just, thing with dance right so you could be showed shown moves pretty yeah. quickly and pick them up very yeah, fast yeah pretty good at, uh, yeah not anymore but you know then when you were younger it's well that's all, uh, that's kind of the hallmark of of dancers coming up in the world yeah. is that you can show them a move and they just do it yeah yeah and he uh then he then we did a couple of dance moves and uh the next day I got a phone call that he wanted me to stand by for Gwen Okay, so you so you, now you're actually in a room with your idol, Gwen Verdon. Yeah. And what what did you learn from her? Well, I learned that you don't mark, ever. But I kind of knew that. But when I saw her perform, she and she was perfect all the time. Explain to people what marking means. Well, marking means that you do it halfway. You do it all out. You do it full out, and with and full out is not just full out. That's a hundred and fifty percent. You know, she was perfection, detail, specifics. And this was all Bob, too. The two of them were the same person, Mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, when Mm -hmm. you worked with them. Uh, But she was so brilliant. Her, oh, she was just so brilliant. Uh, And funny. Oh, just so funny and sexy. And she made sexy funny, you know? It was just, Marilyn Monroe said about Gwen, Gwen did Marilyn better than with her moves, you know, because Gwen taught Marilyn. Oh, she was, I did not know that. Yeah, she was uh, Jack Cole's assistant. I did not know that. But getting back to rehearsals, Gwen, I sat there at every rehearsal. I'd write everything down that she did, every move. And uh, and they changed so often, you know. every With this particular show, we changed the book so many times. And uh, the, the, like... Nowadays, the song Nowadays mm-hmm. and Honey Rag, they weren't in the show until we had, till we had been well in Philadelphia 
doing the show. There was a two other closing numbers that were there. Wait, uh, were, did, were you out of town in more than Philadelphia? No, we only went to Philly. Philly, yeah. and, then, and then into Broadway. And that's when I went on. And this, that's when got hurt, and and I didn't have any rehearsals. I sat and wrote everything down. And so you were you were put into the show with no rehearsal in it. No, I learned Honey Rag and um, uh, nowadays the choreography for that. Tony Stevens taught that to me in the hotel uh, ballroom, a, a hotel that we were staying in, in Philadelphia. He was Bob's assistant, one of them, and uh, and uh, all the other things I just wrote down. And I would do them in my in my room, or I'd work with Barney Martin, who was Amos, or David Rounds, who was the actor who played Velma Kelly's agent. But mm-hmm. that part was written out. And they would work with me, like uh, after hours, we'd just go over the scenes, um, and I would practice my yeah. steps in the lobby. And those of you that are out there listening, who are trying to make it up. In, or make it into the business. Listen to what you just heard, which is that people who had no obligation to help one of their fellow performers actually went out of their way to help a fellow performer. That's the nature of what it should be. Yes, it is. That's, and that's somewhat gone away today. People are very selfish in what they do today. Oh yeah, that's a whole. It's a whole other. A whole other thing, and it's a, it would be great if the world would get back to that, where people had a sense of community and were actually helping one another in their art. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what it is. All right, so Cheetah Rivera, what was that like? Well, Cheetah, I mean Cheetah. I worked with Cheetah when I was sixteen at the Civic Light Opera. Oh, doing in what show? Sweet Charity. She was Charity. Oh my goodness! It was at the arena. What, did they have the dome was, open? Oh yes, yes. And uh, 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 so, quick sidebar: I'll never forget seeing Ray Bolger in the Civic Arena doing. I think he was doing Most Happy Fella. I think. Or was it? No, uh, well, no, that's not the title. I can't remember. I was a kid. I mean, I was a it little It must kid. have been uh, Once in Love with Amy. Yeah, that's Where's exactly, Charlie? Where's Charlie? Always in love. And, and, yeah. and he had gotten bad reviews in town. I'm, this is a sidebar. He had gotten bad reviews here in Pittsburgh, and that night they had the, the roof open, and it was windy. And he came out after the show, and he said, they're not going to blow me out of this town yet. And I'll never forget that line because it got a huge laugh. I'll never forget that. Wow. So anyway, sorry, sidebar. Wow. Cheetah Rivera in in uh, Sweet, Sweet Charity. Charity at the Civic Arena at in Pittsburgh. At the Civic Arena. We were at the CL. It was the Civic Light Opera summer season. Right. With the dome open. Yeah, with the dome open. They opened it every night unless it was raining. You know, it was fun. That's it, awesome. I was 16. And uh, I, Cheetah, here's how I met her. I went up to her. Um uh, and said, hi, Miss Rivera, my name's Lenora Nemitz. And I was wondering, I know that I'm one of your biggest fans, and I was wondering if I could watch you rehearse uh, after I'm finished with my rehearsal at 4 o'clock, because I know you rehearse until 6. Her mouth dropped. She just looked at me like, what the heck is this? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, really. And uh, she looked at me, and I, she said, okay but you can't say a word. And I don't want to see you, but you can. Oh, wow. So I went in, and I sat underneath a desk that uh, Carl Kritz, who was the uh, musical director at the time, uh, I sat under his desk. And and I would watch her. Did she know? Well, she knew I was there. And then we were rehearsing Big Spender, and Cheetah came in to our rehearsal and she said see you watching me now I'm watching you <laughs> yeah that's, that's lovely yeah so uh yeah and 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 I and she told me that she thought that uh uh that I would go far she in this pre- business she predicted yeah. it yeah she did she- and, and and I used to watch her in the wings when I worked with her I worked with her in Bye Bye Birdie at CLO as well before Chicago Oh, because I oh I love Cheetah I love Cheetah and I loved Gwen you know I love Gwen but she's you know. and um, I would watch her in the wings every night doing you know brilliant work and uh, and she said to me you watch me every night and I said yes I do she said okay tomorrow I want you to watch for my mistakes wow okay yeah 
She didn't make any. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she never did. And I've worked with Cheetah a lot, and I've watched her a lot. I've watched her from the wings, from the uh, rehearsal studios, from when I was a child watching her on the Ed Sullivan show yeah. saying, I'm going to be like that. You know, I so, adore her. So what, again, um, clearly an enormously talented individual, but how much work did she put in? What was it all about for her? Was it 150%? 150%. 150 how many hours a day would she work? Well, you work all the time. You know, when you're working on something, I think uh, you have eight hours of rehearsal, but you go home and work on it. You work on it in your sleep. You work on it in the at, at, when you wake up. You're in the shower. You're working on it. Uh, it's a constant walking down the street, going over your lines. It's constant. It, it's a, it consumes you. It's a form of possession. I think that if you really want to be in the theater, you have to love it. Oh, there's no question about yeah. that. I tell my students all the time, if you want to be in the entertainment industry, in any element of the entertainment industry, if it isn't a burning, a burning passion deep in your soul, yeah. you might be in the wrong business because it requires that to be in it. Yeah, it's that's the way they worked, and that's the way I worked. And, and they helped me get better at that. That's what they did. They were the two of the most generous people I've ever worked with, plus Bob. So when, they, when you say they helped you, what did they do? How did they help you? Well, Gwen knew that when, when I stood by for her, it wasn't like a uh, All About Eve thing. It was, you know, truly, she really was uh, hoping that I would be good because nobody knew what I could do except for Bob. <laughs> he hired me, sure. you know. And uh, I would go to her dressing room. I'd write down all the changes because he was always changing the show. And I'd write down every change that they would do, the lyrics, where she went. And before, when we were out of town, I would go into her dressing room around 5 and we would go over everything. So that helped me learn the show as well. And if she wouldn't, you know, we'd just go over it. And if she made a mistake, I'd say, no, that's not right. You, you know, and we would go back. And uh, one day, the producer said to me in the afternoon, do you know this show? And I said, yeah, I know it. And he said, do you think you could do it? And I said, well, yeah, if I, I, once I get up there, I'll see if I can do it. But yeah, I know it. And he said, okay, because she's tired. That night, <laughs> that night during the opening number, she got hurt. This is Cheetah. No, Gwen. No, oh, Gwen. Gwen. And, uh, and you went on. I went on. I went on for the rest of the week. Did and you we go were on? we were we were in Philly. We were we needed the money to get back to to a night uh, to New York. So and I rehearsed with Bob. And Did the you go on mid show? No, I went on right after all that jazz. Right after all that jazz. Yeah, yeah, and it was a story that is long, involved, and wonderful. And I wish I could tell you all of it, but I'll tell you what, there was nothing like that, like that. Uh, experience. Was any of that reflected in the movie All That Jazz? No. No, none of that was. Because, because obviously they that were, was about him. The, all That Jazz was before he had his heart attack. Right. And what would have happened if he had, you know, had not survived it. Sure. Because he was in that rehearsal. And and I assume once you were in that, that um, solar system of a Bob Fosse, you were a lot of people would respect you for that. Yeah. So it helps yeah. to be in that, that, yeah. that gravitational pull. And it helps if he if he really believes in you. And and he well if he, he wouldn't hire you if he didn't, but sure. but he, with me it was different. He he took me under his wing and and he taught me. That's awesome. He taught me and I'm so grateful for that. And uh and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about uh Bob and Gwen. Well, um. That's that's yeah amazing. you know they're always they're in me when someone has that kind of impact on you yeah yeah, yeah. all those people from that time all right know? so let's just move on to just for a moment just yeah. I'm curious about Tommy Toon oh I love him whole different story yeah I love Tommy I got, I got to meet him only once that I met him opening night of Jekyll and Hyde in 2013 at the at the Marquee Theater yeah which was a thrill for me because I think he's just one of those awesome talents um, what was it like to work with him well he's a uh, He's totally different from Bob, and uh, how I got to work with him, and Ryan King was doing Bye Bye Birdie opposite him, 
in the national tour, and uh, she couldn't do it anymore because she had some family obligations. And she suggested to him that he hire me, and uh, I auditioned for him, and and uh, he said, yeah, you lose some weight. <laughs> so I did. Oh, <laughs> I did. Because wow. he's real thin, you know? <laughs> really tall, tall and, and thin, thin and beautiful. And so I did, you know? I got really lean, and uh, I came back, and there we were together. And I got, you know, I went into the show, and I replaced her. And uh, he taught me other things. With him, it was, um, he taught me more about, well, they all taught me about life. But I was more, a little bit older with him, so it was, it was. Well, for uh, instance, what did he teach? Did he teach you about um, career or uh, how how to be as a human being, what did he teach you? He's, he was the beginning of the journey that I had to take to be uh, true to myself. That's interesting. You were not being true to yourself prior to that? No. So, uh, and, and I, uh, because I was not, I was abusing my talent. Do you care to, to expound on that? Well, I, yeah, I could tell you a little bit. Uh, I've been... Uh, I, I, I've been sober for 20 years. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, good for you. And that's a miracle. That is a miracle. Believe me. Um, I, I, and, I and have it, many people around me who have that issue. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's a disease and an allergy, but it's the person there, you know, anyway, it's, that's another story and book and everything, but, <laughs> but, but with Tommy, you know, he was so generous to me. Again, these people that were in my life uh, and the men that were in my life, like Bob, Peter, Tommy, they treated me like a queen. They treated me with great respect, gave me everything, uh, were in my corner always. Always for me, you know? Isn't that something? And I didn't recognize it because I had uh, another agenda, which was alcoholism. Do you think part of it was is that you came up and it in a, in a way happened so easily and quickly for you um, that some people work at it for 20 years before they catch their break? You caught your break fairly young. Do you think that's part of it, that you took it for granted? Well, I did, but it was also fear. That's why, you know, fear. Everything is, it was fear-based. Fear, fear, sure. fear. Sure. Yeah, and I was afraid, yeah. But it was interesting working with Tommy. That's when all of that started. That's when the journey into... He helped to, he helped to direct you on he that. He helped, yeah, he really did. He recognized it. Yes, he did, and he told me. He said, you know, it's about your drinking. Mm. Yeah. That's and, amazing when somebody is, but and you listen. Well, he well he loved me so much, you know, and I, I we lo I love him. He's a great person. I, these people that, you know, that I've worked with, they're great souls. They're so generous, and I know that God put them in my path mm -hmm. because of the journey that was, you know, that I was taking. I I I totally understand what you're saying. Is that. God or the universe or whatever anybody chooses to call it. Yeah. Um, uh, it, when that happens, that becomes magic and a miracle and all the rest of it. Oh, it is. It, it is. It really is. So okay. So I want to. I want to just the last um, star I want to talk about f for the moment that I'm just fascinated by is you work with Lada Lenya. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I forgive me. I only really know her. I mean, I, I I know her story and I know her history and Kurt Weil and all that. Yeah. But I really only know her as Rosa Klebb from Goldfinger. Oh, wow. She's the villainess oh, in yes. Goldfinger. And that's how I know her because that's one of my favorite all-time movies. And so I'm curious about working with her. What was that? had to have been very different. Well, yeah. But I had seen Cabaret in my senior year in high school uh, because our, t our dance instructor took us to New York and we'd study for a couple of weeks in New York. And then we'd come back and we'd see Broadway shows. I'd seen Cabaret. And I remember seeing uh, that she was in the show, and she was brilliant. Uh, it was amazing. I sat there thinking, "I'll never be able to do this. I'll never be. I'll never be that good." She was playing Sally Bowles. No, no, no. she was playing Fraulein Schneider. Oh, Fraulein Schneider! But all the well, dancing, all the all the dancing was brilliant because it was Ron Field choreography. Got it. It was unlike anything 
That play was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Sure. And it was Candor and Ebb. There's Candor and Ebb again, you know. They, been, they're they're gonna... ahead of their time. Sure. Always. Definitely. And uh, I remember seeing all the girls coming. And Anyway, I got in the show the next year. I auditioned, and there I was. And H- how old were you at that point? 18. 18. Yeah. And, and you I got aud- into a Broadway show. I auditioned by chance. I'd, uh, I was auditioning for three different shows that day, and... Uh, and I was supposed to meet somebody there to to give them keys to a car. Um, I went to the audition and I got there early. And uh, the guy said, uh, the doorman said, uh, I said, Do you, is there a ladies room around here I could use? I was going to just wait for the person to come and give them the keys. He said, oh, yes, you can use that dressing room right there. Well, it was Lottie Lenya's dressing oh. room, the star's <laughs> dressing room. I came out of that dress, out of that bathroom in the dressing room, and there, the stage manager was waiting for me. And he said, what are you doing in here? <laughs> I said, I, I, well, I was using the ladies' room. And he said, what are you doing in here? And I said, well, I was using the ladies' room. I was using the bathroom. Uh, he said, what were you doing in the star's dressing room? I mean, he wasn't buying that I had you know, the truth. I said... Uh, well, the doorman told me I could use the ladies' room. He said, the ladies' room is downstairs. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, I came to audition. He said, well, your number is one. Go downstairs and, and, and oh. use that bathroom, and that's where you dress. I got the job Wow. out of 250 girls. Wow. And I, there I was in Lenya's dressing room, and we're talking about Lenya. Uh, working with her, she taught me how to use my Dr. Scholl sandals. Yes, she did. She taught me how to walk in Dr. Scholl sandals. How, I mean, a completely practical thing. She said, Lee, what are you doing? Look at your feet. There's <laughs> blisters all over you. Lee. She called me Lee. And I, I, didn't, I didn't really talk to her that much, but I performed with her, and I watched her in the wings just like Cheetah every night. And I also, the reason I watched her in the wings... She would sing a song in the opening, uh, Who Cares, So What? So Who Cares? It's a wonderful song, Candor and Ebb. And uh, I would stand on the spiral staircase up at the top, smoking a cigarette as a Kit Kat girl, and I would be in a freeze watching her sing this song every night. And, uh, oh, she was brilliant. It was like light came from her. That's the difference. Light came from Gwen. Light came came from Cheetah. It wasn't the spotlight that made them stand out. It was their light their that art, sure. that the audience saw. And with Lenya, that was also true. And I never worked with Katherine Hepburn, but she was in the audience one night coming to see Lenya, and light came off of her in the audience. <laughs> it was like, wow. You know, that's that's what it it is. And that's well, they talk about this it factor in yeah. stars and yeah. what is it and it's in de, it's un, indefinable, undefinable, indefinable and you you can't buy it. You can't train for it. You just have it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, all right, so I, let's talk about training and how you take on a challenge. So you had this rare, I assume it was pretty rare, that you got to play both Velma and oh, Roxy yeah. in the same day oh, yeah. on Broadway. Yeah. Now, how obviously you were prepared or they wouldn't let you do it. Oh, I'd been working with Bob for, for a long, long time. time. Yeah, we'd well, been working on it because he chose me to replace Cheetah. Well, I understand him putting you in a uh, you know, for Cheetah, but but suddenly you're doing both parts in one day well, on that, the same day. Well, that was Gwen and Cheetah, you see, because um, we were all close. You know, it's not like the movies. It's or you know, it was a close family, all of us, and they all wanted to see me. You, there was no conflict backstage. No, no, no. Unlike in the movies, where no. you need the conflict. No, not not with us. Storytelling's no. all about conflict. Yeah. You can't succeed without conflict. You have to have that big bad wolf. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. So so this was a big happy family and they they Cheetah and Gwen encouraged you to do this one day? Well, no. See, uh, Bob wanted to see what I would look like with Gwen because I was replacing Cheetah and this was right before Cheetah was leaving the show. Got it. And uh, so I uh, did the the matinee and that that morning, that matinee at 2 o'clock, and then at night, Gwen said, well, you know, since Cheetah's 
uh, since Cheetah's going to be off in the morning, why don't I take off in the evening? And so I said, oh, that'd be fun. So I did uh, Roxy that night. And that night, after doing Cheetah, after playing Valma in the afternoon, and Bob and Phil Friedman were in, I'd spoken about Phil before, mm-hmm. they were, uh, oh, they were so nervous. They were so <laughs> nervous for me. It was so funny. I just, uh, were you nervous for you? No. No, I was too busy thinking about what I had to do. You know. You didn't have time you know, to be You don't be have nervous. time to be nervous. You have to really focus. That's what I got from Bob. Focus, detail, specifics. You know. Uh, were you on a major high at the end of that day? Or, yeah. Or were you completely spent? No, I was a uh, 25. I was on a real high. That's a know? rush. Yeah. And I... I uh, well, even if I were now, I would be. But then, I, but sure. then we, of but then what? Then I, when I played Roxy, some something unique happened. Ah, uh, we stopped the show. The numbers that Roxy did stop the show. Some like I stopped the show. Something happened, and the show stopped. It was like the audience went crazy. So. Liter- but, literally, the yeah, show and, but, stopped. Well, yeah, they keep applauding until you know they just. Until you start, you know, they don't want to stop. And I remember Bob coming back from uh, uh, the audience after that had happened. And he said, I said, I stopped the show. And he always used to look at me in the mirror, like from behind me. And, uh, in the rehearsal room? No, at the, in, the, in the theater. In if the he theater. came into your dressing room. Got it. He would always talk to me, like, behind me, you know. Just like he would rehearse a dance number that way, too, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he do it looking in the mirror? Yeah, yeah. And he would put his arms on my shoulders, and he always said, you always do what I ask you to do and more. And I said, I, this sh- I stopped the show, and he said, yeah, you did. And uh, you always do what I ask you to do and more. And I, uh, it was interesting because he, he said, it's because you're playing Velma now, and you understand Roxy more. And I always wanted to do that when Annie came into the show, to uh, have the two of us play opposite parts, you know, like... Swap. Do, yeah, I asked him if we could do it, and he said it, no. Did you play it with Anne Ryan King? Oh, yeah, Annie uh, replaced uh, Gwen. And I knew Anne, because Anne was in cabaret with me. The two of us were in the ensemble. We were Kit Kat girls. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. Uh-huh. And uh, and that's a, once again that's the orbit of Bob Fosse clearly. I know, but Bob didn't have anything to do with cabaret at the time. It was just that's just the who, orbit. Who, who, that's... who directed that? Who directed that version on Broadway? Hal Prince. Oh, that was Hal. Oh, of course, we Hal said it Prince. in the opening. Of course, Hal of course. Prince. Yeah. That's that's incredible. Yeah, Bonnie Walker put me in that show. She was the uh, dance captain. Whoa. No, that's another one. Unsung hero because she's so talented. She's worked with everybody, you know. And you don't always hear about those people who who really work w- with the... The you know. unsung heroes. Yes. And sometimes it's the gypsies and sometimes it's the choreographers and sometimes it's the producers. It's the unsung people of the theater that make it happen beyond what we see. Yeah. Because that's where I come from. I come from... from backstage first a little bit of performance that's not been my thing but I'm still sort of backstage and so I get that world really well yeah that's where people sometimes have no idea who's doing it all right they don't I've done it so it's fun I, I mean I love all aspects of the theater especially the theater from that time because it wasn't so self-centered it, it is self-centered now yeah and it's a- kind of greedy and in the professional world much more regulated by the unions than ever before so there's a kind of a regimen to that world where people have to sort of in it if you go down to your basic level of community theater everybody does everything yeah. when you get up in the professional world you can't touch that you no, can't do you this can't. you can't go there and it becomes a lot more regimented in that way right compartmentalized right. Right. Um, all right so let's talk about uh, totally about p- preparation when you get a part when you got halftime say or uh, what was it called first got to dance. dance so so uh, when you get a part what's the first thing you do do you do you learn lines? Do you learn the songs? Do you think about it for a while? What's your preparation method? Mm, I, I I work on the lines. 
And as I'm working on the lines, I start to work on a character development. You know, if it's a if it's a character that is uh, secondary, not really a lot, I really have to um, create more of a story for myself. What do you mean by create a story? You mean you're going within the world of that that character? Yes. And creating the backstory for that back character that yeah. may not be exactly on the page, but right, you've got to create it. Right. You've got to create it. Mm-hmm. That's what I do in in uh, in in halftime. And and okay, so. I, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to hear from you. What does that do for you? How do you? Why do you do that? Uh, so I'm not boring. <laughs> so you're not boring. So you're fleshing out the character. I have. When I worked with Bob, he used to give me a. He would say, <laughs> "Okay, now we're gonna. We'd work together." And he would say, "Now I thought about that. Can you come up with something different?" I'd say, "Okay, how about this?" And we'd start. And he'd say, "No, I thought about that already." I had like fifty to a hundred different reasons why a character would do something, so that it was never boring for me or the audience. There were different emotions, t- doors, uh, avenues I could go to whenever mm. you know I needed to, and uh, then I if I needed it. And and that's why I do it, I think, because we, I need everybody needs to be a character on stage. And one of the more challenging things about being in the theater is the the constant repetition of performance after right. performance. Uh, were you was this so that you could make adjustments as time went on to keep it fresh? I think so. I think. I because, think because I think that's got to be one of the most challenging things of anybody that's in a long run. Yeah, you really and and you really have to get in it. You have to get in it, and sometimes it's hard to do that. Of course, you know. But we have, uh, you know, all of the tools that are given to us as we, you know. So you've you've toured quite a bit as well. Yeah. So we're sort of talking about that world. What? What is it? What do you do on the road to keep yourself occupied? Because clearly, there's a lot of time where you're not performing. On the road is, uh, it, it it's really hard t- uh, to be on the road if you're not young. <laughs> <laughs> you mean being young, it's easy? Well, because you know, physically, it's easier. It gets e- it's e- it's harder when you're older. I think. For me, it, it was just, I used to put one foot in front of the other. When, I, when we toured with Cabaret, for instance, um, we started doing one-week stands. You know, one week here, one week there. So on Monday, we would travel. Tuesday, we opened the show, uh, you know, and uh, Wednesday, Thursday, two shows, uh, Friday, two shows, Saturday, two shows, Sunday, and you leave early Monday morning, and you travel, and the producers travel you the cheapest way they can by, you know, when you're flying. So you could be going from Ohio to New York, but you'll go from Ohio to Texas to uh, (laughs) Denver to New York because you have to get connecting flights because that's the cheapest way to do it. So by the time you get there, you are... You know, it's your day off. But, it, and, but, but and, you're kind of working anyway, even though you're not on you're, stage. You're working to get where you got to yeah, go. Yeah, got to work where you're going. Yeah, and and you have to stay in shape. You know, when you're on tour, so you usually go to the gym. You, for me, that's what I did every day. I would, you know, go to the gym and uh, see a little bit of the city, but not really because it was, you know, it wasn't. You weren't. Um, you weren't being a tourist. That's for sure. Right. You just work. Just work. Yeah, and you do it because you love it so much, you know? It's a, because you have to. It's in you. You know, even if you don't want to, well, you just what, do it anyway. That's what we it's said like, before. I think once show business gets into your veins, it's very hard to scrub it back out. Yeah, we're gypsies, aren't we? Oh, we, yeah. we are gypsies, yeah. and you just keep doing what you do. And, and even when things don't work so well, you keep going yeah that's that's what it is so so that would lead me to the question um what would you say is the biggest single disaster you ever experienced and how did you work your way out of it something on stage perhaps that was things a disaster just, yeah something just completely the scenery collapsed or something you sur- surely have had something happen to you over time where or or even in your career something that just went wrong and how did you solve it how did you get get through it you know, I can think of funny. That cause all the disasters are funny to me. Isn't that? I mean, I think that's good. It's you know, all the disasters that's are healthy. funny. <laughs> this isn't a disaster, but I'll tell you a funny story. 
I mean, I have tons of funny stories, but I, I thought a, 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 Lady Kazan and I were doing the rink in Coconut Grove, and she was playing my mother, and I was playing her daughter, <laughs> <course>. okay? <laughs> and uh, she's a great gal, and what an actress. And we had a scene where I leave. We have this, uh, I'm on the phone talking, hang up. The, we have a huge argument, mother and daughter screaming, just an argument. And I leave the stage, and the guys come out, and they sing, we're going to go around the rink, the rink. They sing about the rink, okay, and they're okay. on roller skates. And then I come back in, and I get the phone. I had just enough time to go to the bathroom at the Coconut Grove Playhouse. Okay. So I ran. This is in Florida, right? Yeah. In Florida. Yeah. I ran fast, and I ran into the bathroom. I did it fast, you know, and you have that microphone, and you got to make sure that the battery pack doesn't <laughs> fall in the in the toilet, you know, in the water. So you got to do all that stuff, and don't pull the mic out of your hair and everything. Get get it back, and I'm go on, and I get back on stage, and there's toilet paper stuck to my. <laughs> My heel. <laughs> There's toilet paper stuck to my heel. And uh, I, but it was the whole roll. And it, but it came from the bed. It, it was still on the, on the, on the toilet to paper, toilet paper holder. So it was all the way around backstage, followed me all the way <laughs> on stage. And it kept following me. So when, when the guy said to me, you, this is for you, I said, oh, thanks. And I couldn't figure out why he was laughing. And I'm standing there talking on the phone with this long toilet paper that goes off stage. <laughs> <laughs> and Lainey comes on, and she's looking at me, and she starts laughing and says, Angel, what are you doing? I said, "That's it's it's for you. And I sat down, and I looked, and I there, there was the toilet paper, and it was, it, was in a, it was in a pattern on the stage. Now she's laughing. I'm laughing, and the audience starts laughing. And she said, what? are you doing? And this is when we have to go into, uh, we would go back in the past and I would be a 16 year old girl or a 13 year old girl going to a dance. And I would say to her, look at me, just look at me. And I would be in the mirror and she would come over and say, you look at you. And she, she came over, she was brilliant. She came over, she said, you look at you. Now get those up, get those up. And she was talking about my, you know, my bosom, my breast, <laughs> which I didn't have any. And she took that toilet paper and she took it and started <laughs> making it. And she put it right into my costume. Well, the audience went crazy. That's hilarious. Isn't that funny? That's hilarious. We left. I, I peed my pants on stage. It was so but funny. But you had just gone off stage to do that. I know, but, <laughs> you know, I lost total control. It was just a wonderful... <laughs> all those funny things that happened on stage. I remember Anne Ryan King and I both fell at the same time because I, I had a... We were doing Honey Rag, and we were doing a shimmy where I was on the... Uh, bottom part, she she would shimmy above me as two moving as one. You know, we would do this thing where we both go back and come forward, and we were like in a hinge, and we did that. But my rubber on my heel had uh, come off, so my heel went from under me, and I fell on the floor. And so she fell on top <laughs> on top of me, and she jumped up and put her hand out, and up we went, and we just kept dancing and laughing. <laughs> Dancing and laughing. Did you laugh all the way through it? We laughed. We laughed. Oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> Have you ever had anybody, um, you had a prop of some kind and somebody did something to the prop to make you laugh? Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, I, that's, 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 that's... Yeah, but I always liked that the audience can share it. Once I went on, oh, we were on, um, we were doing, uh, when I did Pajama Game. You know, you can always, Jerry Orbach used to always check his fly before he'd go on stage. And I would say, why do you do that? He'd say, because it, I have to make sure it's not down. Well, and I would think, oh, okay. And there <laughs> I, I was doing the pajama game. We were doing Steam Heat. And we started, um, we started doing, you got to shove them all coal in the boiler. And the audience, I could hear them laughing in a way that I'd never heard a laughter before. And I looked over, because I knew it was somebody's fly was down. I looked over, and it wasn't Jim Borstelman. And I looked over there, and it wasn't David Cook. And I looked down, and it was mine. And 
<laughs> oh, it was so funny. Oh, it was so funny. I took my hat, my derby, and put it down there and, and zipped it up. Did and it get a big laugh? Up. Yes. The audience went crazy. They love it when th- I love it when things happen like that. Oh, oh, the audience loves it when things get all messed up. <laughs> I know. You know, it's the it's the old uh, Carol Burnett show with the t- uh, uh, Tim Conway and, oh, and yes. Harvey Corman where they're just laughing their butts off, and that's hilarious. Yeah. And the audience is in on the joke, and there's nothing really more delightful for an audience to feel like they're really in on an inside joke. Oh yeah, you got to let the audience in because they're a part of it. You know, it's all about giving. <laughs> so living is giving. So how giving do you, how do you stay sharp what do you do to stay sharp how do you keep the well full Mm, I do a lot of physically I do Pilates I do a lot of Pilates and that helps you both physically and mentally mentally yeah what Um, what does the physical exercise do for you mentally as well well those endorphins get my brain going you know and uh, I've always been a physical person that's what it is you know it's I, and I take voice lessons if I'm you know I take them even if I'm working. So you know, so once again here's vocalize. this this philosophy or uh, work ethic that I think is important to pass along, which is I think we have a unfortunately a generation that some of which don't think they need to work as hard, and this work ethic you've been doing this a while and uh, you clearly know what you're doing, but yet you're still taking lessons. And you're still working on your your physical being. That I think is in, incredibly important for people to understand. That that doesn't go away no matter how long you do it. No, you have to do it. It's just you have to. I, Sometimes I, you don't want to, but you do it anyway. Because by, by the way, it's the same thing with writing. You can't stop writing and expect to have a period of time go by and just become a, be, continue to be a good writer. You have to keep writing just like you have to keep acting and keep singing and keep dancing and keep exercising. It's all of of the same sort of thing where you must continue to do. Yes. You know? Yes, it is. So uh, do you have, beyond the hilarious stories we just heard, do you have one specific quirky, like really oddball story that you can relate? Oh, quirky oddball. Uh, you mean we- like weird or something very strange yeah. happened? When we did Cabaret, uh, and Cabaret was written in the 60s. That was not long after the World World War II, you know, with the Holocaust. It wasn't that long. And, uh, and Cabaret was a show that uh, audiences would gasp, you know, when they saw it at the... At the Originally, it was uh, groundbreaking. It was ahead of its time because of the Nazi Be- element. Yes, yes, and the way it was presented, uh, the brilliant direction. Oh, sure, and the choreography. Well, that, that too. The fact that it was kind of racy and um, uh, I don't know what the right word would be. It was uh, sexually uh, more provocative than I think a lot of shows of that day. Yes, but it also had to do with the the Holocaust. You know, all mm-hmm. of that and how it happened. How it happened without people really, really acknowledging it. Denial is, you know, uh, is runs rampant. <laughs> are, are we maybe experiencing some of that again? Well, it runs rampant all the time. It's mm-hmm. not just, you know, it's always mm-hmm. there. But sometimes it's more than others, you know. I And I was with Lenya. We were doing the fruit shop scene. And that's where Ernst comes in and he is... Uh, it's the first time we see the swastika. He is a member of the Nazi party, and he's been uh, doing, bringing money in and out of, uh, uh, into Germany. Uh, and uh, he comes to the party. And we were all, I was with Lenya, we were standing on stage behind the fruit shop uh, uh, counter. Mm-hmm. She had just gotten her fruit bowl. We were there talking, and... Uh, he took he took his when he took his coat and he had a swastika on his uh his his suit a man in the the mezzanine started yelling they killed my family oh, they no. killed my family oh. they killed my wife they killed my family and he freaked out and he said he was going to get a gun he was it was, I mean, it was really frightening. Wow. It was frightening. And I was young. I, I, I looked at Lenya. I, I said, she said, Lee, come with me. And she, we both went down to the floor and kind of 
hid underneath the the fruit shop on stage counter. Yeah, because we didn't have that much to do at the time. She her cue wasn't coming up, and he was this man was yelling. He had gone mad. We just went because no one could see us. She yeah. said, "Come," and uh, and I guess it kind of freaked her out because you know she lived it. Yeah, oh sure. Yeah, she went. She, she lived it. Yeah, she knew. She uh, yeah, and uh, it freaked me out because I was I was frightened by that. I. I remember saying to the stage manager, did you take care of that man? And he said, well, yeah, we kicked him out. And I said, well, but did you give him his money back at least? And uh, that was the end of the conversation. I felt that's how powerful that show is. Well, it is that powerful. Yeah, did, that's how did, powerful did art you, is. Did you, you know? fear at all? that? Because this is a totally different time and age, and even yeah. though he had clearly gone through a horrifying holocaust yes he had uh did you fear that perhaps you'd step outside the stage door and he'd be waiting for you <laughs> yeah yeah you never know you know because today you'd really be worried today it would it. be yes it'd be a big deal today, today. Would be, yeah but uh, then it was you know, it was it was shocking and we did the kick line after that we did the second act it was the kick line and that choreography we came out looking like stallions like german stallions man it was that was exquisite and funny and groundbreaking, innovative, everything, just everything. That show was everything. Yeah, it, it really was. And Chicago and was that is. way. And Chicago was that way, too, when it opened. And, and unfortunately, it opened when Chorus Line opened. And nobody wanted to see what was going on. Everybody wanted to see, you know, a Chorus Line. They wanted happy instead yeah. of, you know, yeah. There's a all this underlying kind of darkness. Sure, and and I you know theater is sometimes highly reflective of what's going on in society as it's happening. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting. You can go back in history and look at uh, the way that Broadway, what shows are on Broadway during certain periods of time, and you can see that the heavier or darker shows are in periods where there's not a lot of dark in the world, and when it's uh, dark in the world, the shows want to be lighter because people want something else than what they're experiencing. Right, right. They want to be released of their day rather than go into more of it. Right. Um, so, for instance, in the in the eighties, where you started to see Phantom of the Opera and Les Misérables, and you started to see heavy, dark shows. Right. The world was okay at that point; it yeah. wasn't so bad. And then, as things got darker through longer periods of time we started to see lighter shows you started to see the producers and back to musical comedy right. so it's interesting well i have been having this incredible conversation with the amazing lenora oh, Nemitz for 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 <laughs> the last hour or so and as we're wrapping up the show i'm wondering there are tons of people that are out there that that would love to hear what piece of advice or a tip perhaps that you have that would help someone who's in the business and trying to become more successful or sh struggling to break in in some way, what kind of a tip might you be able to lend us? Oh, um, know who you are, and that takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. That's inner work. Yeah, it does. And that that's, uh, t that's usually the, the road less traveled. That's going inside. Like you're working on a character. You're working on yourself, too. You know, it's important to know who you are. Uh, but... I think the most important thing is to just show up, mm. exclamation point. Mm. Just show up. That's, that's a lot of it, isn't it? Yeah, just show up. And that's, that's deep, too. That Just those three words are very deep. Just, just show, show up. up. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's incredibly important. And yeah. uh, uh, I can tell you from school that sometimes there are students who don't show up. And they don't show up consistently, and that's a problem. And yeah. you, you know that they're going to have a rough ride. And the ones who do show up, they tend to be the better students, the more attentive people. And that's what you're talking about, is that you can't do this by not doing it. That's right. It's a, it's a do-it kind of business. Yeah. Action. Well, Lenora, this has been a great thrill for me. Well, it's uh, been fun for me, too. Well, good. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm so <laughs> glad. And, you know, perhaps at some point we'll come and do another hour and we can hear even more. Oh, that would be Cause fun. Because who doesn't like to talk about themselves? I, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect you might have more stories in there somewhere. I do. 
<laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for stopping by. Oh, you're welcome, and thanks for having me. Oh, believe me, it's my pleasure. Oh, thank you. Today's Story Beat tip. Screenwriters and playwrights can only deal in expressing what characters do through two senses, sight and sound. Audiences cannot smell, taste, or feel what a character on stage or screen is actually smelling or tasting or feeling. Audiences cannot know what is going on inside of a character's head unless the character tells us or shows us. Unlike in novels, screenwriters and playwrights must only write what the audience can see and hear. Audiences cannot see a character realize anything, nor can they see a character think about anything. Great actors may lead us to believe we know exactly what they are thinking or realizing, but we cannot know for sure. Therefore, avoid writing what the audience cannot see or hear. Rather, express such moments through dialogue or visuals. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.